You might have heard that Estonians invented Skype. Well, here today we have a living proof of that. Our third keynote will be Mr. Jan Tallinn, who is one of the founding engineers of Skype, also of, of Kaza and others, but has now turned to more existential matters. So it has become a sort of a tradition that the last keynote of Saikon is always forward-looking and looking to the future. So Jan here today will uh, talk about artificial intelligence and especially the concerns related to that. Please. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Imagine a giant spaceship, a ship that's so big that it can carry entire humanity. And in fact, although the construction is not finished yet, the boarding has already begun, and our children are already on board. And everyone's excited about the upcoming trip. Now there's something is not quite right with this thing. The construction is consuming billions of dollars and millions of man hours each year. Yet there's a small group of people desperately trying to point out that this project has a problem. You see, nobody is working on the steering mechanism. Of course, these people are ignored. After all, this is the biggest project humanity has undertaken, and uh, so why we should uh, listen to a handful of dissidents? Also, the engineers are quick to explain why working on steering is a complete waste of time. For instance, one large group is claiming that this thing is never going to take off anyway, at least not in the next 300 years. Another group asserts that steering is trivial. Once we had really powerful engines, the spaceship will automatically go where we want. Or, at the very least, we can easily improvise the steering mechanism after the takeoff. Third group explains that controlling this thing is impossible in principle, so why would we waste precious resources on that? There's also a handful of people, a handful of engineers, who argue that making the spaceship to take off is our ultimate mission, so caring about the payload safety is just backward and selfish. On top of that, there's also this massive peer pressure to ignore the dissidents and not signal sympathy with them, even if you feel uneasy yourself. Now, all these answers, while contradicting each other, have two things in common. First, they are excuses why nothing needs to change. And second, they try to hide an embarrassing fact. The embarrassing fact is that the spaceship project simply forgot. They forgot about the steering wheel. What I just described was a metaphor for the state of AI research just a few years ago. Of course, metaphors are never precise, so they have to be taken with a grain of salt. That said, this particular one is surprisingly illuminating. Let me count the similarities. First, the moment when AI exceeds human-level intelligence is often referred to as takeoff. And people debate whether the takeoff is going to be hard, that is, too quick for society to react, or soft. Second, the takeoff is going to affect everyone, especially the children, because they are closer to the future, so to speak. The potential impact of AI takeoff is often compared to those of the agricultural and industrial revolutions, or sometimes even to the invention of brains by evolution. Third, just like rocket takeoff, designing robust AI takeoff is a hard engineering problem. Quoting AI risk researcher Eliezer Yudkowsky, aligning superhuman AI is hard to solve for the same reason a successful rocket launch is mostly about having the rocket not explode, rather than the hard part being assembling enough fuel. Fourth, it looks likely, or at least plausible, that we'll only get one chance to get this right. If the takeoff catches us unprepared, the result might be a disaster of cosmic proportions. 
quoting Eliezer Rutkowski again. If you want a picture to symbolize what we are worried about, don't imagine a picture of the Terminator robot with glowing red eyes. Imagine a picture of the Milky Way with a 30,000 light year diameter sphere kept out of it, centered on Earth's former position. Fifth, over the decades, there have been hundreds of billions of dollars and billions of man hours spent on making the metaphorical engines more powerful. The AI is now smarter than humans in many domains. Yet the talent and budget that humanity has spent on the steering mechanism, that is, making AI more predictable and controllable, can be rounded to zero. Sometimes I compare it to the fact that uh, we have spent less on it than we spent annually on tobacco advertising. Sixth, if you asked AI researchers a few years ago about the control problem, you got all these conflicting answers. It really felt like this dire straight song. Two men say they're Jesus. One of them must be wrong. Seventh, there were a lot of peer pressure to not talk about the AI control problem. You can still witness that pressure when you watch panel presentations where AI researchers sit next to each other. It takes them real effort to acknowledge the issue when their colleagues are around. That peer pressure is also a sufficient explanation why recent AI risk discussion was started by people outside the AI research community. It takes a poi to point out that the king is naked. My favorite evidence of the peer pressure, though, was when two AI researchers, who I know were very, very concerned both about the AI control issue, were surprised to find each other at an AI risk conference. Before that, coming out of the closet moment, they had been working together for nine years as a student and supervisor pair at a world-leading university. Finally, here's a quote. Let us now assume, for the sake of argument, that these machines are a genuine possibility, and look at the consequences of constructing them. It seems probable that once the machine thinking method has started, it will not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Who said that and when? The father of computer science, Alan Turing, in 1951. Here's another one. If we use to achieve our purposes a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere once we have started it, because the action is so fast and irrevocable that we have not the data to intervene before the action is complete, then we had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire and not merely a colorful imitation of it. Who said that? The father of cybernetics, Norbert Wiener, in 1960. Not to mention the famous sentence by Turing's colleague, I.J. Good, about the ultra-intelligent machines being humanity's last invention. This gets quite a lot, good quite a lot recently. So yes, the entire field simply forgot. Having painted that depressing picture, let me add some good news. The situation has greatly improved over the last few years. In 2014, Nick Bostrom's superintelligence book was published. It became a New York Times bestseller and caused many people to start paying attention. In January last year, Future Flight Institute, that I am a co-founder of, held an AI risk conference in Puerto Rico. It was deliberately set up as a physical meeting between the AI risk community and the AI research community. And the tangible outcomes of the conference were, first, an open letter calling for AI safety research that was signed by many, if not the leading, uh, if not most, the leading AI researchers. Second, Elon Musk, who was there, donated $10 million for AI safety research. Money that FLI, Future of Life Institute, has been handing out in research grants since. Perhaps most importantly, though, the conference created a bridge between the AI risk and AI research communities. It put friendly faces on inconvenient arguments and created a mutual understanding that there are reasonable people on both sides. In December last year, the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at the Cambridge University received a 10 million pound grant from Leverhulme Trust to establish the Center for the Future of Artificial Intelligence. 
Since Leverhulm Trust is uh, one of the largest private funders of science in the UK, their commitment signals that AI safety research can now be seen as part of mainstream science. Earlier this year, Open Philanthropy Project, a charitable organization founded by Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskowitz, who has committed to giving away his $8 billion fortune, published a report titled Potential Risks from Advanced Artificial Intelligence, the Philanthropic Opportunity. It's an impressively thorough and well-researched document, and I suggest you look it up. The target for more resources globally to, to be spent on re researching how to reduce AI risks. It's also wonderful to see the peer pressure crumbling. More and more AI researchers are willing to defy the party line and say that controlling artificial intelligence is indeed an important topic that has been neglected. One reason why this delights me a lot is that I have seen something that most AI researchers haven't. I'm an Estonian, so I had a front row seat to the collapse of the Soviet Union. I saw that once the state stopping persecuting dissidents, their views were quickly adopted by others. Initially, of course, the dissident opinions were watered down and qualified to sound more moderate than reasonable. Eventually, though, the mainstream opinion became nearly identical to the original dissident position, and the few remaining hardcore dogmatists and communists were left behind. Eventually, many dissidents, as well as party members who had switched sides, became the new leaders. I see a similar process unfolding in AI circles. As of now, as of now, most AI researchers still feel the need to downplay the AI risk issues to sound moderate. But I think this is just an historical instinct. Some researcher, researchers are openly dissident and therefore leading the charge for change. In particular, I want to thank Stuart Russell, the co-author of the leading AI textbook. By the way, uh, as an aside, I was on a panel in London yesterday with Stuart. And he's saying that he's rewriting his textbook now. And this, his textbook indeed is used as a main, uh, the most popular textbook in academia to, to teach students about AI. So Stuart is rewriting it in order to reflect the new mission of AI research. And Temis Asabis, the head of DeepMind, because they are publicly challenging the old party line in AI research community. If the collapse of the Soviet Union is any indication, we're just a couple of years away from the point where AI risk topic is considered a natural part of the mainstream discourse. Finally, and most excitingly, we're starting to see first fruits from the research. For instance, AI risk researchers have recently published papers about how to make reinforcement learning agents not care about being turned off. And reinforcement learning is the, one of the most popular uh, approaches to AI these days. And also how to avoid wireheading failure mode, where the agent takes over its own reward mechanism. There are also some fresh technical results about how to teach machine learning systems to understand and do what we want, instead of maximizing uh, a naive goal function that uh, programmers might have given it. So using our spaceship metaphor, some engineers are already designing and testing various components that might be needed for the steering mechanism. Of course, unfortunately, all these positive trends are facing massive challenges still. For instance, even though there's an attitude shift underway in, re in AI research community, it's not clear yet how to make AI research research an integral part of the field. As Stuart Russell puts it, uh, like, if you ask an engineer to build a bridge, making sure that the bridge doesn't fall down is kind of considered part of the task. You don't like, kind of hire bridge ethicists to look, out, look around, look over the shoulder of the bridge engineers to make sure that they actually or like, have like, governments uh, to, to take that responsibility. No, it's the responsibility of the engineers to make sure that the bridge doesn't fall down. But quoting Hulden Garnowski from the Open Philanthropy Project, he said, ideally, I'd like to see really leading AI researchers in AI and machine learning play leading roles in thinking through potential risks including the associated technical challenges. Under the status quo, I feel that these fields, culturally and institutionally, do not provide much incentive to engage with these issues. Stuart Russell likes to point out uh, 
that just like nuclear fusion research is now almost entirely about containment and no longer about increasing the power, we need to also redefine the fundamental mission of AI research to be about creating value alignment, value aligned systems, not just increasingly competent systems. Of course, another source of constant frustration is bad journalism. Because the media is incentivized to maximize the number of clicks, it often produces shallow articles with sensational headlines like, and this is an actual headline, Terminator Center to open at the Cambridge University. Such misrepresentation makes the AI risks, risk arguments look silly and therefore undermines the hard-won hard trust between the AI risk and AI research communities. Just a couple of days I made a uh, point to American journalists that uh, if, you, if you count the numbers, uh, how many future people their bad articles might affect, bad AI journalism should be called as a crime against humanity. Finally, I see a looming research talent bottleneck. Because improving value alignment is fundamentally harder than increasing AI competence. In the words of AI researcher uh, Jacob Steinhardt, knowledge is something that is regularly informed by reality, whereas values are only weakly informed by reality. An AI which learns incorrect facts could notice that it makes wrong predictions, but the world might never tell an AI that it learned the wrong values. We need many more smart researchers to work on the AI value alignment. Some scientists go even as far as to advocate genetically enhancing humans for that very purpose. Overall, I'm actually optimistic. Even though humanity lost about 50 years by forgetting about the AI risk, the recent progress gives us hope that we can catch up in the remaining time. There might even appear commercial incentives to work on the value alignment. You see, Increasingly autonomous robots need to avoid making gross ethical mistakes in situations as their programmers, that their programmers did not foresee. Again, as Stuart Russell says, the day that some domestic robot decides to cook a cat will be a very bad day for the robotics industry indeed. I'm also sure that the media will improve once people become better at recognizing and calling out bad AI journalism. Hopefully also talk like, talks like this will help. Last but not least, I'm really encouraged by the amount of interest among young people. In my experience, people under 30 seem to be very likely to understand and appreciate the AI risk issue. 80,000 Hours, a career guidance site for effective altruists, reports that the AI risk researcher profile is now their most read, most read career guide. In conclusion, Imagine the giant spaceship again. 50 years in the making, children already on board, tens of thousands of engineers improving the engines and adding the fuel, and a tiny but a growing group working on engineering, or on the steering. When will the ship take off? Will the steering mechanism be ready in time? Will the takeoff be hard or soft? Will this thing simply explode? And if everything works out, will it take us to somewhere nice? No one knows yet. Luckily, human engineers have been able to construct reliable space spaceships before, rockets that take off safely and fly where we want them to. Hopefully, we can pull it off again with this metaphorical spaceship, because the stakes have never been higher. Thank you. Do I see a sea of hands? Not even one question. Probably you're so mesmerized by the concerns related to artificial intelligence. So let me ask, um, you said that you're overall optimistic regarding uh, artificial intelligence and, and the future. Where do you think we are in in let's say 20 years, what will the situation be? Will there be control mechanisms uh, developed? Will the research community support more this, uh, your view? Uh, I mean, as far as I can tell right now, yes, like uh, it, this trends. I mean, sometimes people ask me like, what, what is the probability of actually 
making it through the century. Uh, my co-founder uh, at the Cambridge Center of the Study of Existential Risk, Martin Rees, Royal Astronomer of Britain, uh, he, he gives 50-50 chances for humanity. Um, and uh, I'm like about the same level, but uh, um, uh, I think the chances are, it's kind of, it depends like, are you going to uh, look at the, sort of the default outcome or, I, or will you also consider the good trends that steer us away from the default outcome, which I do think is a disaster. So uh, if you don't consider the uh, good trends, then the outcome is almost a certain disaster in my view. Uh, but uh, there are indeed like very strong uh, trends. Unfortunately, they are like fairly young, just uh, less than five years old. So it's kind of uh, hard to be confident that they will continue in the, in the, in the right, right direction. Just like when the Soviet Union was collapsing, like it was very hard to be confident that these trends will actually take us in the right direction. Luckily, they did. Thank you. No more questions then. This is a gift from us to you, uh, a gardening terminator. <laughs> Thank you.